Welcome to the Commerce Talks podcast today at Shop Talks in London. We are talking about Mattel, direct to consumer, wholesale businesses, the journey into the digital ecosystem. Please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elisa Pogliano. I am a senior director of digital media and the director of consumer e commerce for Mattel Agrosimia. And for the ones who don't know what Mattel is, I don't know if there's any listeners who don't know what Mattel is, but uh, can you introduce like Mattel and the main brands? What kind of revenue on a global level are you making? Of course. Well, it's absolutely possible that, uh, you know, some of the listeners may not know Mattel as the name, but we, they will certainly know our brand. So um, Mattel is one of the biggest toy companies in the world um, with brands like Barbie, Fisher-Price, Hot Wheels, Uno, Master of the Universe. Um, so that's definitely our heritage, a toy company. We obviously also produce toys for some of uh, the biggest uh, entertainment companies in the world. So we have licenses such as Disney Princesses, um, Turn Universal, you have the Jurassic World franchise, Minions, uh, DC Superheroes from Warner Brothers. Uh, but it's also a company that is uh, reinventing itself and expanding itself as an entertainment franchise. So the, the brands I mentioned, really, they are franchises in their own rights. And we are expanding them across live events, across uh, obviously consumer products that are going beyond toys, like think Barbie or Thomas the Tank Engine backpacks, um, as well as uh, content. You might have heard that we have a Barbie movie, very exciting for us. I, I, I've, I've heard about the, bar the Barbie movie. So all of our kids and we have grown up with those brands, Fisher Price and Barbie especially. Um, when I um, recall where we bought those brands, and sometimes it, uh, it was a pr Fisher Price set which I got from my older brother, same like for the bar Barbie set. But um, we all grew up in a world where we usually went to a store, um, a Toys R Us store, a My Toy store, um, um, depending on what 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 kind of country you were living in, and picking something from a very huge shelf of Barbie products or Fisher Price um, products. My kids have seen a store, but they've chosen to only buy in online channels anymore because uh, there's a wider selection and better prices. Um, what, what, what's your view on the yeah, brick and mortar retail uh, um, um, channel for your products? Well, I think what you're saying is definitely right and we've definitely seen it. I mean, I joined Mattel seven years ago and prior to that, I was at Procter and Gamble. And when we had the category that had 10% participation online, we felt that was a lot. But then I joined the toys industry and already at that time, the participation was way higher. And of course, as for a lot of categories, it has really shot up in the last couple of years. So I definitely still think there is a place for bricks and mortar retail. It's really hard to replicate that experiential aspect. And uh, it's really important for kids and parents as well to connect with our brands in those uh, live events and settings that I mentioned before, which often, more often than not, are related to, to retail environments. However, it is undeniable that the trend is only going to continue. And, you know, as for many other companies and many other categories, we've seen it shooting up with COVID. Uh, we've seen people going back to stores a bit uh, right after the lockdowns, which I think does prove the point that, yes, there's still a space for physical bricks and mortar retail and for that uh, experience. However, I can only see that in the long term, the trend is definitely going to be towards online and e-commerce. Has Mattel ever experienced with, uh, ever experimented with uh, flagship stores? Because the Barbie brand or the uh, the Fisher Price brand is so big, uh, it could make have sense to to have a, a Barbie store at an airport, for example, or at a A plus location. Um, it's not an aspect that I personally have known a lot because we haven't done so in uh, in our region. However, I know that around the world there have been a few experiments. And then, of course, there is a brand which, again, we do not really um, market in, in EMEA, but is called American Girl. And that's a very different model. It's still part of, of the Mattel portfolio. And, uh, and yes, we do have flagship stores for that. And uh, your title says direct to consumer e commerce, or, or it's in it. How important is direct to consumer e commerce for Mattel? Well, direct to consumer e commerce is a really new venture. When I say new, I mean it. Uh, we literally just launched um, the Mattel shop in uh, the UK, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain six or seven weeks ago. So it's really, really fresh. Um, out of, of completeness, I, I do want to say we do have a direct to consumer business for collectors. 
um, which is called Mattel Creations. Um, that's been running, not necessarily under that brand name, but it's been running for a number of years. It's primarily US focused, although of course it has a global reach. Uh, and it's a very different business model. It's all about collectors items. So it's all about these limited edition drops. And, and so it makes perfect sense because of the complexity, because of the higher price points and, and because of the uh, that direct uh, relationship with the collectors is, is necessary to do it direct. But from a mainline point of view, this is our first pilot. And I'm proud to say that EMEA is the pilot region for the world. So we, we've actually just started, as I mentioned. Um, and yes, so it's a very, very exciting new venture. And it's obviously something that we, we definitely believe is going to enhance our overall business. And it's something that we really feel it's something that customers by now expect to be part of their customer journey, whether they decide to buy direct or not. So usually the, the buyer is not your customer. The buyer is the parents of your, of your customer, which makes it a bit harder to connect with the customer. And many, many of your customers, children, they don't have like mobile phones. So there's no like we are here at Shop Talks. You, you see a lot of new modern tracking capabilities. So lots of the strategies cannot be used because you cannot uh, send like a three year old toddler a newsletter. Absolutely. Right. So um, but but how uh, how do you how do you solve this? So what what um, what when you think about direct to consumer e-commerce um, what kind of customer journey comes to mind saying okay it makes more sense for a consumer going to barbie.com yeah and selecting a special barbie set with add-on features instead of going to amazon or my toys or toys us.com so first of all i think all of our customers what we really see is they increasingly want to connect with the purpose of the brand the ethos of the brand and they also want to see everything that is available i know you mentioned at the beginning that in online retail there is a wide range and that's certainly true but it's not always easy even when the range is so wide to actually appreciate it and see the merchandise in a way that makes logical sense to your point, the people purchasing toys are typically adults who are not the final consumers. So it can be a very daunting purchase for them. And you mentioned parents, but it is even more important when you are a gifter. And by gifter, what we what we mean is uh, it could be grandparents, it could be aunts and uncles, it could be that you're buying for uh, the child of your friend. So basically when you're buying for a child that is not your own son or daughter, well, that's becoming even more difficult because you're really looking for reassurance, for information, and really to see everything that is available. And that's really our sweet spot. That's the experience that we aim at building with the direct consumer. As I said, we're only just at the beginning, but the vision is to create this hub that really responds to the needs of gifters and makes their customer journey a lot easier. I've discussed this with a former guest today at the Shop Talks already. Um, one of the biggest challenges for building up a direct to consumer business out of a wholesale business where you're in your manufacturer, but like selling via wholesale channels is to uh, change the mindset of the organization. So many people in the organization would say at Mattel, hey, it worked out pretty much uh, pr pretty cool for us uh, the last year. Why should we why should we concern our wholesale partners with a direct consumer uh, initiative? I want to give all products I have to Amazon. Would be the, the, There must be like um, a responsible manager like for the Amazon channel in Mattel. Um, Elisa, I don't want you to hold back some products for your exclusive direct to consumer channels. Doesn't make sense because the consumers are already at the other platforms. How do you manage this kind of mindset change in the organization? So I think the whole organization really understands by now the need of the of the modern consumer. And we're also seeing global brands, both in our industry, but also in other industries, um, you know, really making inroads in this space. And I think everybody is fully understanding that wholesale is by far our most important channel. And we actually want to create something to the direct to consumer that helps us and helps us grow in that whole business. Uh, for example, to the direct to consumer, we can glean insights about what our consumers want. And it's really interesting because everybody says it, uh, but the moment you actually start living it as a formerly B2B company, which suddenly starts to get that proximity with the customer and you can really see a, the speed is completely different. B, the kind of insights that you glean on the customer journey are really important. And I think in the long run, they will really shape how we do marketing, 
uh, they will shape uh, how we understand what makes customers tick, how to best merchandise the products. And these are all learnings that we can absolutely transfer to our entire business. So our entire business can really benefit from that. Okay, can you guide us? Like, b because you said it's an early experiment. So we are in the early days of direct to consumer at, at Mattel. So what is the first experiment look like? I, I, if I would have to guess, I would say, It's like uh, Barbie.com, and you have like all, and you would find more um, uh, more products, more different versions of the product on your platform than on uh, Toys R Us or, or or Amazon. And then you would put out a Google AdSense campaign uh, and try to to lure customers in. That, that that would be my naive guess. We haven't talked about that before. How does it look like in the reality? So the the experience is actually a Mattel branded website. There are, of course, areas for the different brands, but a part of this is also we want to see how people can discover the different brands that are part of Mattel, how we can start to communicate the Mattel brand more, um, and how we can see how people might interact, again, between different brands, or, you know, of course, people may have more than one child, so they may shop across different ages and stages, different categories, different play patterns. So it's really important and interesting for us to see what do they put in their basket and what's their journey across all those different brands and, and types of products. Um, and then the other experiment that we have run very, very early on um, is the launch of the Monster High uh, Reaper dolls. So uh, Monster High, uh, for those of you who may not be so familiar with it, uh, is one of our flagship brands. We launched it the first time in 2011 and it was a massive success um, and there is more to come. So as a teaser, this year uh, in May, we've actually launched those four dolls, the original four dolls of the, of the four key characters. Um, and we've just dropped them uh, with a very limited edition um, without too much marketing. We've sent some emails uh, to our customer base, but we haven't really done too much. And we'll just put them on the website. And again, this is not something we could have done so easily without a direct-to-consumer in such a controlled way. But through this experiment, we just saw that those dolls just sold out in a matter of hours. So that's fantastic because it gives us so much confidence for future plans, both for other brands on the direct-to-consumer, but also for the Monster High brand when we bring it to, to market in a bigger way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so so I gonna find like under Mattel.com, um, I guess your your full assortment of um, of products. Or how many products are we talking about? So th there is a difference here between the products we sell direct to consumer uh, and the total assortment of products. So this is both a catalog website and a direct to consumer website. This means depending on the market on the geography, you'll find maybe 2,000 products in total, but then a few hundreds only will be sold direct to consumer. And how how did you build the uh, the um, the uh, the operations around it? Have you started yeah, with your own warehouse in every region? Have you reserved some space in existing warehouses? Because this direct to consumer thing is very different from what you've done before: handling returns, handling payments, handling customer requests that want to call Mattel because there's like a, a broken Barbie or a broken Fisher Price product. Yes, exactly. As you say, the, the exigencies of a direct-to-consumer supply chain are very different. For this reason, we have decided, at least, uh, at least in the initial phase, um, to partner with a third-party logistics provider. Um, with regards to customer service, uh, this is actually run in-house with some agency staff, but, uh, but it is something that, again, because we really want to make sure that the customer experience is prioritized and we want to glean those insights about the customer um, we, it's something we want to keep really close to to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and um, from a revenue perspective, I would guess the direct-to-consumer channel is not yet super important compared to the wholesale channels. Is this correct? I am not at liberty to discuss any numbers, but as I mentioned before, the wholesale channel, of course, also in our plans, remains by far the most important. Have you seen any interesting innovations from a manufacturer's perspective uh, in retail where you see, okay, now we have seen Amazon like for the last 20 years growing, 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 but not changing the way how they are selling. Um, we've discussed on the way like many options for specialized uh, retailers. Toys R Us actually went bankrupt in many parts of the, um, of the world. Were there new approaches how, um, how the young generations could be convinced of using your products you've seen in the market? 
Um, I, I definitely think that, you know, all retailers are reinventing the way they go to market. All retailers are making significant investments in e-commerce. I think it would be definitely really interesting. It's, again, even more early days to, to say, but I think it would be very interesting to see how this metaverse idea develops. You know, is this just a craze or is it actually something that will develop into a commercial opportunity? And I think... If it does, like it is promising to, then certainly those uh, companies which may not even exist today that will be pioneering in this space could become the retailers of the future could, or could become a very important route to market anyway that retailers have to use. So I think it's, it's definitely something really fascinating to look at. What's your view on Metaverse? I think there is definitely a very big potential. I don't think we know yet what that potential looks like because it's, it's like being in those early days of the internet and nobody would have uh, imagined Google or Facebook. But your, but your customers, many, or many of them in the younger, younger ages, are already in some kind of metaverse, exactly. Roblox uh, and others. So have you played around with like producing digital assets? I'm not talking about NFT, whatever, just like placing the logo, placing the products in, 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 a, in a Roblox environment, for example? Yes, yes, we have, and, and uh, there's definitely more to come. And uh, also from my point of view of NFTs, we, we have actually uh, included as part of our collector's business uh, some uh, uh, Barbie and Hot Wheels NFT drops. So we are definitely experimenting in this space. And I think the next level of this is to create shoppable experiences. And I... I don't think that this is something that has been done so much yet, certainly in our industry. And I've seen some experiments in various other industries. It's again, you can definitely tell it's very early days, but I think there's a lot of potential there and definitely something to, to keep experimenting with. A couple of years ago, when um, some manufacturers started with uh, direct consumer businesses, the um, wholesale partners started to scream and say, we don't want it. We built your brand and the wholesale channels and now you're, uh, now you're uh, um, harvesting um, our profits on your on your own website. H have you seen this kind of reactions uh, in the Mattel case? I think things have evolved very significantly in the last uh, number of years, and and of course, you know, by now there are so many brands that are doing this, and it's still obvious by now that this is not the way it's going to pan out. It's it's obvious that the direct-to-consumer has a role to play and actually can enhance the overall business. And that's why I think those reactions may, may have well been the case, I don't know, a decade ago, but they are very much a thing of the past because by now the, the whole industry is a lot more mature. When you're looking at your the Mattel.com operations, um, trying to think about how you can grow it, what are the growth channels or growth tactics that are most interesting for you? Is it influencer marketing? Are there... Because I've heard about like YouTube, YouTube channels from kids that are that have like millions of followers, million of million of views that could drive like the Mattel traffic. Is it Facebook, Instagram, other channels, TikTok maybe because it really attracts a very young generation? Well, I think we we have to be careful when we're talking about speaking to a young generation. We have to be extremely careful about the channels we choose. We have to comply with all the regulations, whether it's COPPA compliance, obviously we, we are a US company, uh, or GDPRK in Europe. So I think there are very few channels in which we can safely and ethically speak to the children. Of course, there are some, and we do use them to engage them. Um, however, there are many more channels that we can leverage to uh, reach out to those adults that are buying for children and for themselves, because actually what we call the Kiddles trend is growing and a lot more toys than you may expect are actually purchased by adults for themselves. So I think those audiences can definitely be reached through a combination of, let's call them a bit more expected channels, uh, such as, uh, you know, could be social media, could be PPC, certainly influencers marketing is an interesting one. I think that the influencers industry is evolving as well. And I think the idea of social commerce married with, of course, the talents of those creators that are better at not just uh, creating hype, but also selling products. I think this is something that can definitely be um, further developed in the future. We know it's extremely big in Asia, uh, here in Europe. Uh, there's a lot of talk around it, not necessarily so much execution yet. It's still a little bit behind, uh, certainly when you, when you look at what's happening in China and Asia. Um, but yes, I think there's, there's a lot of potential there too. And again, how this f fuses and merges with the metaverse is all to be seen. 
uh, I'm starting to see companies creating their own influences. Effectively, you can almost say they're meta influencers. So they create their own characters, their own narrative, and their own social media accounts. And again, that's very early days, but it'd be very interesting to see how this develops. Are the uh, brands Barbie and uh, Fisher Price um, as popular in the Asian world as they are in the Western markets? I can't comment so much on that because I have never worked on the on the Asian uh, business. However, I can definitely tell you we've got a very strong presence in in those markets, and they are certainly very very popular brands. Where are then your innovation hubs? We had a, a speaker today from Mars um, who is investing uh, a lot in the Amsterdam team. They are running a lot of experiments in the in, uh, in, in the European region. Uh, your limited collection um, you've talked about in the beginning. That was marketed mainly in the US, if I understand correctly, right? Uh, yes, that's right. So Mattel Creations, our business that's more uh, focused on collectors, is marketed out of our headquarters uh, in Los Angeles. Um, however, the direct-to-consumer pilot that we're running, as I mentioned, is focused on EMEA and the team is based out of the UK. So I would not say we have one innovation hub, but we try to innovate across all the different businesses and all the different departments and, and regions that we have across the world. And then the same last question, which I asked the other podcast guest uh, today, if you're like looking from a bottleneck perspective, like to grow, like to grow your your platform, what what is, what is it? What you're holding? Uh, what holds you back from growing another 500 percent next year? Is it um, advertising money? Is it the availability of exclusive uh, product uh, lines? The av availability um, of talent? I think it's probably all of the the above. All of these obviously are very important levers. But if I if I had to uh, to take to pick probably one and that you mentioned and and maybe also expand into one that you did not mention, I think. You definitely hit the nail on the head when you say talent is going to become a challenge. I think that this is not something that is limited to one industry, but certainly I, I can see this becoming a need. And I'm, I'm surprised that, you know, when you look out at what sort of formal education is available for people who want a career in e-commerce, for example, there are not that many options and yet it's such an important and expanding and, and growing industry and I'm uh, constantly I get even calls from adult colleagues and and they're asking me you know maybe they they have taken a slightly more traditional path and they're like how can I learn more about e-commerce and Yes, of course, you can tell them, you know, listen to your podcast or uh, um, subscribe to this newsletter or, or attend the book. or read the e-commerce book, um, <laughs> shameless plug, um, or, you know, attend conferences like, like Shop Talk. But if I had to say, okay, do this one course or, or, you know, take this one accreditation, there isn't an awful lot. And I think that this is definitely something that universities, institutions, governments need to take more seriously to form the next generation of e-commerce talent. Yeah, I think your hint with uh, listening more to Commerce Talks podcast is a good start for... Uh, Absolutely for a great start. Many of the talents. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely looking into the more exclusive line of uh, Mattel.com. Follow up on uh, on your e-commerce progress next time we're meeting. Edisa, thank you for being guest at our Top Talk Books. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.